Okay, so I think I'll kick off the proceedings with an introduction. So, Tools Hedges has been the big pioneer in a subject called open game theory, which he will explain, but he will explain it with a special view towards trying to apply it in various practical ways. And applied category theory is a new subject, so its meaning is still pleasantly vaguely defined. And some people want it to be more applied than others, or more precisely, some people are more in a hurry to get it applied than others. I think everyone thinks it's good for it to be applied. Uh, and so I think some of Jules's talk will focus on that, that issue of how we, how we get there with open game theory. So he has just gotten his 5,000th Twitter follower. So we should all <laughs> congratulate him on that. And he's speaking to us from an undisclosed location somewhere in England. Uh, so welcome Jules and let's hear your talk. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, yes, this is not going to this is not going to be a theoretical talk, and I am not really going to explain how open games work. Um, the unfortunate fact is that it is not it's not possible to both explain how open games work and also talk about anything else in one hour. Um, so, if you want to know how open games work. Uh, I have six hours of lectures on YouTube, and if you go on my homepage, uh, you will find links to six hours of lectures on YouTube. I am going to give a, I guess, a mostly a meta-level talk about the experience of trying to, as John said, uh, being in a hurry to um, get applications, um, which I really hope should be mostly understandable without knowing how open games actually work or indeed what they are. I'm going to say what they are at some point, but it's going to be uh, quick enough that it's unlikely that if you don't already know, you're, you probably won't pick it up. I'm going to start by explaining those what lenses are because this is kind of central to the whole thing. Um, so, we, we built this category where the objects are pairs of sets and then the morphisms, so we write this as a positive thing and a negative thing, but this is the notation that I'm going to use today. Um, an amorphism from a pair to another pair is going to consist of an ordinary function between the positive things and then this, this backwards function which has this very strange looking type from x plus times y minus to x minus, so it's, it goes backwards along the negative things but it also takes this x plus as an extra input. So a morphism like that is called a lens. And, <coughs> and if you have a pair of them, you can compose them. So, well, along the top, you just have function composition. Along the bottom, you have this quite strange looking rule where the composition of the u's also involves v1. So, you can you can kind of stare at this. This this is the the only thing that it could possibly be, and the fact which I think is not an obvious fact is that this is actually associative. I think it's I think it's not obvious just from looking at it that this is that it's associative, but it turns out that it is. Um, so you get a category, the category of lenses. Um, you can also make this into a monoidal category, where on objects you take point-wise Cartesian product of the positive thing and the negative thing. So I could spend an hour talking about the structure of this monoidal category, which is very interesting, um, but I'm only going to say a little bit about it. So, okay, let's pretend we're physicists for a moment, and not mathematical physicists, but like physicists, physicists. So if y is f of x, then f prime of x is dy of dx. So if you rearrange, then dx is dy divided by f prime of x. Okay? So, we're just pretending, pretending for a moment that infinitesimal is real things. So it turns out that f together with um, this second thing, which takes x and dy 
to dy over f prime of x. That's our, that's our backwards function. These things together form a lens, or they form something that looks like it ought to be a lens. And it turns out that they do actually compose in the right way. So if you have, if you have an f followed by a g, then, um, and then if you have an f followed by g, and then you have x, and you have dz, and you want to know dx, then, well, the chain rule tells you how to get dx from that data. Uh, but the chain rule ends up, in this form, ends up being precisely lens composition. So normally this, this would be called morphisms of cotangent bundles, um, which is the, the fancy name for um, what this is in a, in a general um, smooth manifold. Uh, so this is the this is the boring degenerate version when all your spaces are flat. So taking a step back, the term lenses comes from computer science, um, where so I had this function v and u. Uh -oh, here we go. No, v and u, where v, v stands for view and u stands for update, because these are actually operations on data structures where v is some um, zooming into a data structure and then u is a function where if you do some destructive update on the result of v it will tell you what's the resulting destructive update on the source so that's where the name lens comes from because you're zooming in um, but what i have so my current point of view is that leibniz should have priority on this and so i've turned the subject inside out and now i say destructive updates composed by a chain rule um, so saying, saying using this kind of language isn't completely new because there's existing chain rules for conditional probability and conditional entropy. And they're, they're named that by analogy with the chain rule in calculus and they, they have this kind of form as well. Um, okay, um, okay. A, a dubious claim I have is that this equation dx equals dy divided by f of x is kind of the central trick of machine learning. So this is this is uh, my understanding of how back, how back propagation works. Okay. So this category, this category of lenses, I defined it over sets and functions, but in a completely straightforward, obvious way. You can do the same thing over any category with finite products. It turns out that, well, it seems that at that point you get stuck and you can't generalize any further than on our product categories, which is very sad because we would, for certain applications, really like this over a monoidal category. And it turns out that this, there is a generalization of this to monoidal categories. So this is called optics, and the definition is this scary thing. So this thing, this equation is a co-end, and it's a co-end in the category of sets because home sets are sets. Um, and co-ends, because it's just in sets, so we can just write down explicitly what it is. So this, this formula beginning with an integral is actually a certain equivalence class of triples of a V from X plus to Y plus along the top, which also spits out some extra, extra parameter of some type which we've quantified. And then a backwards thing which also depends on this quantified type. And it turns out that this is a proper, proper generalization of the definition I gave you before in the sense that if your monoidal category is actually Cartesian monoidal, then this, this reduces to the same thing. And the proof of that is not trivial, it requires your Nader lemma. Um, so by the way, I didn't work out any of this stuff. Um, a, lot of people, a lot of people work on this stuff and I'm just a consumer of it. So my historical claim is that so it briefly looked as though computer scientists had just worked out a kind of trivial case of morphisms of bundles that looked like morphisms of, of flat bundles or trivial bundles um, but it turns out that this to this generalization over a monoidal category is actually the, a, a genuine new thing um, of i think significant mathematical interest so my my 
dubious claim is that this gives a big generalization of the chain rule or things that structurally look like the chain rule. And this works over any monoidal category, which is a completely silly amount of generality. You can do a lot with this. Okay, so here's another thing that you can do with it. Um, so if you pick your favorite um, probability monad, so, so the simple case is you take the category of sets and you take the monad of finite support distributions. And there's various fancier versions of this. A closely, a closely morphism of this monad, which is a, a, a function from, or a morphism from X to D of Y, is a conditional probability distribution. So it's a distribution on Y given X. So this is, okay. So, so these closely categories, of, closely categories of these distribution monads. Um, Excuse me, someone is unmuted who, go ahead. Okay. Um, these are always monodial categories. Um, the, the monodial product is basically never a categorical product because if it was, then a joint distribution would always be determined by its marginals, which you don't want. Um, so the main reason that I would like optics over a monoidal category rather than lenses over a finite product category is that I want to apply it to these categories of conditional distributions. Okay, so here's my, here's my next example of something that kind of looks like a lens, which is if you have a distribution of uh, Okay, we also have, so we have a closely map x to d of y, so conditional distribution on y given x. Now, suppose we have a prior, which is a distribution on x, and then we have an observation, which is an element of y, then Bayes' law gives us the posterior, which is a distribution on x. So this is a thing where you take a dx and a y, and you get out a dx. So modulo a little bit of fudging with the types, this also looks like a lens from x to y. This together with the forwards map, which is your conditional distribution. And it turns out that this does in fact, this does indeed work in the sense that it's functorial. So if you have, if you have a conditional distribution on y given x and one on z given y, um, then, okay, so composition in the closely category correctly gives you the distribution of Z given X. And if you want to know how to do Bayesian updating of a prior on X given an observation of Z, um, then, then, the, the, then the lens composition law tells you how to compose together the individual Bayesian updates for these two processes. Um, I'm I'm seriously hand-waving here. Um, I'm, I'm, ha I'm hand-waving several things, the biggest of which is division by zero, the fact that Bayes' law, um, in the event that the observation has a prior probability of zero, Bayes' law is undefined. Um, but morally speaking, this gives you a functor. Um, so my collaborator, Toby Spice, has actually done the hard work and proved this and, and put it on a proper foundation. I like to handle. Okay, and I'll, I will come back to this example in a bit. Okay, um, we also get a, 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 natural, a natural notation for drawing pictures of optics. So an optic from x plus x minus to y plus y minus um, can be drawn like this, and I call this a cone diagram. Um, so x plus and x minus go on the outside, y plus and y minus go on the inside. So categorical composition corresponds to this thing which I'm calling bigger fish composition, which is put one around the other like this fish is eating this fish. Um, and why do I call this the natural notation? It's because the, um, the equivalence relation that defines the co-end, that defines the category of optics, corresponds to isotopy in these diagrams. So it corresponds to sliding things along this A-labeled wire. Okay, um, and yeah, lots of people, well, lots of people are working on these these uh, cone diagrams at the moment. Okay, 
time for the definition of open games. I have to give it at some point. So an open game, okay, so open games are going to form the, mor the morphisms of a category. And the objects of the category are again going to be pairs of sets, which I'm again going to write like x plus x minus. So a open game from x plus x minus to y plus y minus is going to consist of three things. The first thing is an indexing set of strategy profiles. The second thing is a family of optics which are indexed by that set. Um, and you can be fairly general here. Um, and it doesn't have to be exactly optics either. You can fiddle with it and the thing still works. Um, but the, the most basic one is going to be optics over the closely category of a distribution like that. Now, the third thing is where it gets complicated. So for every strategy profile, which is an element of our indexing set, and every context, and a context looks like this, it's a three-toothed comb, and it's going to consist of, so look, if you look at the shape of this, this diagram, and, if, and you look at the types in these holes, and I go back one slide, so an open game still, has, still can be drawn as a shape like this, and this shape can be slotted into this shape and the types line up, the x plus y plus y minus x minus all line up. So you've got to think of inserting an open game into this, like this. Um, so what a context actually is, is a certain equivalence class of triples, again, where theta is a set, and then h is a joint probability distribution on x plus and theta, and k is a conditional distribution on y minus given x plus and theta. And then you've got to, and then you've got to get the equivalence relation right, which turns out to be isotopy if you if you use this notation. Um, by the way, the, the reason that the symmetry is broken in this diagram is quite interesting, um, because it looks like everything should be symmetric. And the reason is that uh, my preferred base category which is conditional distributions, is a thing called a um, is a is a thing called an affine monoidal category, which means it's or semi-Cartesian monoidal, which means the monoidal unit is terminal, um, which eventually comes from the fact that there's always one probability distribution on a single point. Namely, you can only do that thing with probability one. Um, so that's the reason that the symmetry breaks here. Okay, <laughs> now in order to compose two open games, you have to do some, some uh, shenanigans. So if we have open games G and H like this, the first thing I have to tell you is that the, um, the sets, sets of strategy profiles are composed by Cartesian product um, and the indexing set, and I haven't even written this down because it's, it's so obvious, the, um, the optics being indexed composed by optic composition. Now, so, so GH looks like this, this two things around each other, this bigger fish composition. So um, to evaluate, so, so now we're given a strategy profile, which is some, some indexing, so some, some index in, in sigma G and some index in sigma H. And then we have a context, which is this three pronged thing that you can fit around GH. Well, what we can do is, because we have sigma and tau, we can evaluate H at tau, and that gives us just an optic. And then... Um, there are some, I think I, well, sorry, I'm interrupting at a very inopportune yeah. time, but there's popular demand for an example of an open game or why the mathematical or an explanation of why the mathematical structure you presented is, is interesting to be or... called an open game. Yes. Okay. Um, if I skip ahead, I think two slides. Um, so if you look at this string diagram at the bottom, um, eventually we get a we get a symmetric monoidal category of open games where the morphisms are open games, so we can denote them by string diagrams. 
And it turns out that these string diagrams are quite intuitive. So, um, so you can read off the information flow here. So every time you see something plugged together left to right, that's the sequential composition, which is the thing I was about to hand wave the definition of. And every time there's something side by side, that's the tensor product, which I was not going to define. And in these string diagrams, you can read off the information flow in a game. So this consists, so, so in this game, we have a player who's choosing the element of X. And then that is copied. One copy is going to the payoff function, which is Q. Another copy is being observed by player two, but player two doesn't observe it perfectly. They're observing some function of it. So they have some imperfect observation of, of what player one did. And then they choose an element of Y. So now you have an X and a Y and you feed these to your payoff function, which is a function from, from X times Y to pairs of real numbers. And then these pairs of real numbers get fed back to your players. And these are the utilities which your players are individually maximizing. So, um, so you can kind of visualize the, the information flow in the game. And this is a bona fide string diagram in a bona fide monoidal category. And this is a non-open game now? It looks not open. Yes, game. this is yes, this is a this is a closed open game um, in the sense that its boundary is trivial. So this a uh, this is a um, what's the word? It, the technical term is a scalar, an endomorphism of the monoidal unit. Um, but you, I mean, if you take any individual diagram element, then that's an open game. So P2, for example, is an open game from, oh, I haven't, I've picked the one that I didn't label. If you look at P1, for example, is an open game from, from 1, 1, which is the identity monoidal unit to X, R. So this, this um, the, the sets which I'm labeling with plus and the sets which I'm labeling with minus do correspond to forwards pointing arrows and backwards pointing arrows in this diagram. Another very connected question is in this category of open games, you'd call them the morphisms, open games, and what would you call the objects? Oh, I mean, they're, they're, they're pairs of sets. Sometimes, sometimes, oh. What would you call to... them to make them sound like they're something to do with the games? Sometimes, if I need a fancy word, I'm calling them die sets. Well, no, but I meant, but I meant, what, no, 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 I guess I didn't mean what you would call them. I meant, what would someone call them if they were trying to make it sound like it had to do with games? Is it well, like they're, a, they're, oh. they're boundaries of games? Uh, they're, okay. they're boundaries through which a game can communicate with the outside world. But what, are the, what, is, what is the game theoretic meaning of the two sets? Game, game interfaces. Well, that's, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I, I don't have a, five years on, I, uh, I don't have a clear answer to this. The, 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 the forward thing, the, the forward thing is a set of things that can actually occur in physical play. So, so moves, uh, moves and observations. And then the backwards things are, are um, counterfactuals there, things which players are reasoning about counterfactually. So I don't have a, I don't have a snappy answer to this. Okay. But in general, in general, objects are boring, right? Can well, that's what they say, the but they still call it the category models. of vector spaces, so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it also, I mean, I'm, I can't see the relationship, but it almost feels like uh, it's related to Markov decision processes where the objects in this case would represent the set of states, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm coming to Markov decision processes later. So that's, uh -huh. a, that's a good comment. So, so can you interpret these objects sort of as like states in some sense? Mm, ah, yeah, I see. Um, in a sense, yes, at least the forward part. Right, exactly. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Um, okay, I'm going to accelerate past this part to save time. Uh, it's completely hopeless, really, to explain how open games work in such a short amount of time. Um, but the, the, the trick, and my favorite currently way of explaining this, is that you do this kind of thing with these cone diagrams. So. Um, you can now see this 
this the three pronged thing together with H of tau, you you put a three pronged box around this. So you you view you view that as a three pronged th thing into which G has been inserted. And similarly, um, so I've drawn this in a planar way, but my underlying category is symmetric, so I can pull this top thing underneath the bottom. So we also have a thing, uh, a slot into which we can put H. So this is the, the kind of thing that you have to do to define composition of open variables and prove that it's associative. Because, I mean, this is the, this is the um, advanced technology way of seeing it. Um, originally, this was done by, by pain and lots of equational reasoning. Okay. But I want, to, I want to talk about this not from the perspective of a category theorist, but from the perspective of an, of an economist or a domain expert. Why would you want to use open games? So open games are compositional, that's the point. Um, but actually this is the main point which I want to come back to later. What does that, why, why would a domain expert actually care about compositionality when it actually comes down to it? Um, we get an ex as a side effect of this, we get an explicit representation of the way that a game theoretic system can interact with the context, and that's something which some people think is quite nice, potentially might be useful in some situations. Um, it turns out we can exactly capture a solution concept. So we get, we get some, flexi some flexibility in the solution concept, although not a lot of flexibility, but we can capture Bayesian Nash equilibrium, um, which is currently my View of the cross with ordinary Nash equilibrium, um, and it can talk about some kind of real economic effects like signaling. Yes, in 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 some certain ways, open games are extremely flexible. So, for example, uh, we don't have to talk about real numbers and maximization, but we could, we have a lot of flexibility to replace that with more qualitative things. Um, also, um, it turns out that Bayes' law is not very deeply baked into this. So you can actually replace Bayes' law with quote unquote mistakes to talk about players who imperfectly reason, who, who do imperfect Bayesian reasoning. Um, so in, in certain ways, we get some very nice flexibility. <coughs> the really big thing is that we get these string diagrams. Um, so we get, so um, these kind of fall out um, because we get a monodal category, so we get string diagrams for free. Um, and this is a just a just as a visualization tool. Um, so game theory already has a representation called the extensive form, which is visual. Um, but the extensive form draws the tree of all plays. So the size of this tree ends up being exponential in the number of stages. So for anything bigger than, for example, the extensive form gets extremely out of hand very quickly. Um, if you have more than about five stages, um, this thing can immediately get bigger than your whiteboard. Um, so my, my claim, that this is one of the things I'm banking on, is that um, string diagrams are actually going to be a very nice visualization that's a, that's a compromise in between normal form and extensive form. So normal form is a, is a very compact representation, but it's not visual. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this, this mostly remains to be tested, but um, many of the economists that have seen this think that it's quite a nice representation. Um, the fact that this is a completely formal representation in the sense that there's all of, all of the coherence for monoidal cash breeds underlying this is a bonus. Okay, it's not all roses. So, in many ways, um, in many ways, open games are extremely inflexible. Um, certain things which are more or less trivial in standard game theory turn out to be, I have no idea how to do them. Um, compositionality is extremely delicate and it breaks very easily. Um, the really big problem is the learning curve. Um, the learning curve for, a, for an economist is absolutely brutal. Um, so ideally I want to put all of the theory in a box 
and seal the box and the economist never has to see it. And in practice, that can only mean software. Um, it turns out that the string diagrams work extremely nicely for um, very symmetrical games where um, the, the qualitative things that can happen, like the sets of moves available, uh, does not depend on the choices that, that happened previously. Um, and that situation is more the exception than the norm. Um, so normally you get some kind of dependent types where the, um, the set of choices the players have available and also the player which is making the choice can depend on what moves were chosen earlier. Um, so we can deal with this, but it, it needs some overkill diagrams need to go up to three dimensions. Category theory gets pretty difficult, at least if you're me. Um, and the other big thing is that game theory has a whole slew of its own problems, most of which uh, compositional game theory says nothing about. So we say nothing about how to compute equilibria, which is a computationally intractable problem. We say nothing about the equilibrium selection problem, which is the question of uh, how the players in the game chose the equilibrium which they did. Is there a question coming? No? Okay. Um, okay. We have a, 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 a well. I'm sorry. Uh, there's a question about what that large blackboard picture has to do with games, just to, I guess to like get a sense of why such a thing would um, show up. So, so, so this is a picture I drew of a market entry game. I took an example out of the, the thousand page book Microeconomic Theory by Maskell L. Wilson and Green and I turned it into a and I turned it into a surface diagram. Um, so each of these sheets is like a, a possible universe during the play of the game. So um, when when you make some choices you you kind of branch off into one of these sheets. And then there was a question about what the there's one edge that ends in a dot, it fizzles out. Yes, I, I think that's, oh, the, the, the small dot, that's just delete. So you just throw out some information. That, that's, just throwing, that's just throwing away, yes. Yeah. We have the ability to do that here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, occasionally you need to do it. Okay. I, I thought the delete was in the other direction, actually. This is, this is de deleting something that's already going backwards. Um, yeah. I, I've, I mean, I've, I've skipped about four hours of theory here. Okay. Okay, so we also have this, this thing called open learners, which is also quite well known. Um, and it turns out that an open learner from so there is a category of open learners, and it turns out that an open learner from X to Y, so the objects in the category of open learners are sets. It turns out that an open learner from X to Y is just an open game from XX to YY with two additional constraints. One is that the best response is only allowed to depend on K at one particular value, and which is the one value which we definitely have available. And the other is that this that um, so best response usually returns a, a, a set and we require that it only returns a singleton. Um, and all of the composition works out the same. So we get a we get a monodal subcategory. Um, conceptually, this this difference in the first point, um, k of b sigma of h tells you the outcome that you actually got, whereas all of the other values of K are counterfactual. So they tell you what you would have got if you had done something else. And I'm using subjunctive in English to, to say this very carefully. Um, so in game, um, game theory is, one of the reasons game theory is difficult um, is that you have to be very, very precise about these counterfactuals. Um, but in machine learning, in basic machine learning, we don't have that. Um, but my current working hypothesis is that these two extra features, or also three extra features, to not be on this diagonal subcategory of objects x, x, and y, y, um, are also useful for 
machine learning. So my current working hypothesis is that if you want to do categorical machine learning, you should also do it in the category of open games. Um, yeah, well, uh, certainly the restriction that, that your updates are deterministic, that this thing always returns a singleton, I don't think we're going to go away from that. You always want a unique parameter update. But the other, the other restrictions, there are, there are good reasons to want to restrict that. Okay, coming back to the, um, oh, I think I might, I might skip over this a bit, um, the time, but um, the thing about coming back to, to Bayes' law is that on real examples, um, computing posterior is hard um, because integration is hard. I think the state of the art, you can do this in something like 500 dimensions, but people would like to go much higher than that and it's computationally hard, so you approximate it. Um, and I have this in mind as a new application of backprop as functor. Um, so, so far in backprop as functor, um, the goal has been to learn the forwards thing, V, where the backwards thing, U, I'm, I'm using my own terminology, not the terminology from backprop as functor here, but the, um, previously the, the backwards thing has just been the computers as the derivative of the forwards thing, um, whereas, this is the other way around, that the forwards thing has been fixed and we're trying to learn the backwards thing. So we're, we're trying to approximate the Bayesian inverse. Okay. Um, we can also do reinforcement learning. Um, oh, maybe I should also skip this for time. Um, well, so given, Given the setup of a jointly controlled Markov process, so some people on the call will know what this means. Uh, so you have a state space and you have an action space, and then your current state and your action uh, will stochastically determine your next state and give you a payoff. And, um, and your actions are jointly controlled by a bunch of agents um, who each get their part of the payoff. And each one has an individual goal to maximize the discounted sum of the payoffs, by which I mean we have an exponentially decaying parameter that makes the sum converge. So it turns out that um, surprisingly, and this wasn't by design, open games are quite good for this. Um, so an, an, an optic from QRN to the monoidal unit turns out to be the same thing as a function from Q to R of N, to, to Rn, which is the right type for a value function. It's a thing that gives you the value of every state. And the rest of this information, plus a choice of policy, which is a, I call this a strategy profile here, which is a function from Q to A that tells you what, how your players will behave in every state. That's the thing that we actually want to compute. Um, for each one of them, we get an, an optic from QRN to QRN. And it turns out that if we, if we start with this, this co-state going to the monodial unit given by our initial, our initial value function, which is usually something like the identically zero value function, and then we, um, and then we keep composing backwards, this thing does value function iteration, which is a, a method. You can use this method to compute uh, Markov equilibria of these things. So the slogan is that the value function iterator is a representable functor on category of lenses. Okay, um, I, and I ran this on a real example. I was working with Wolfram Barfus, who's a, a postdoc at my institute in Leipzig. Um, he had his um, model of ecological collapse as a, as a jointly controlled Markov process with two states, a prosperous state, and which is like the world we apparently live in, and a collapsed state where everything's gone bad. And in a prosperous state, the two players are playing a social dilemma to either uh, pump out pollution or, uh, or, or invest in the environment. And it's a social dilemma in the sense that each of them has an individual um, incentive to pump out pollution and get immediate payoff. And then in the, in the uh, and everything is probabilistic. And then in the collapse state, um, the players lose their autonomy. They, they, they don't control the situation. They don't control the situation anymore. They just have to wait for transition back. Um, and we had, we had some real numbers coming from a, a real paper and a real MATLAB implementation. And uh, my implementation using co-end optics, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, did successfully converge to the same numbers that were coming out of the MATLAB 
code um, with the minor caveat that I nearly melted my laptop um, because when you compose optics together, the quantified variable in the coens gets bigger. And when you do this a bunch of times, it gets very big. Okay. So, as I mentioned earlier, if we want economists to use this, and I do want economists to use it, this is, this is designed with, with use in mind, with economists in mind, we need, we need computer support, software support. There's, there's no two ways about this. This is not practical to use with pen and paper. Um, some people have mathematically very nice, clean settings where they have, for example, um, complete proof calculi on their string diagrams. So, for example, you could use edX calculus. Um, we know since recently that you have, we have completeness. Um, open games aren't even remotely close to this. The string diagrams in open games are much more of a visualization. You still have to compute this underlying data. Um, this this uh, best response given a context, which is not depicted in the diagram. Um, and doing that with pen and paper is, for practical purposes, impossible on any real example. Um, the monoidal category structure of open games, it turns out to be extremely easy to implement in Haskell. Um, so we get we can write we can write snippets of Haskell code to represent open games, and we can have a sequential composition operator and a parallel composition operator. Um, it turns out that working with real examples is still extremely impractical. Um, by which I mean, translating a string diagram into code still takes about an hour of intense concentration. Um, the main reason for that is that Haskell doesn't know Maclean's coherence theorem. Um, and in a string diagram, there's lots and lots and lots of implicit isomorphisms, and you have to put them in by hand, and it's a nightmare. Okay, um, so we would like a string diagrams compiler. We don't have where you put in the diagram, you get out this term with all of the isomorphisms um, worked out for you. This is obviously possible in principle, but we don't have time to wait. Um, so I made a domain specific language. So this is going to start looking like computer science, I'm afraid. Um, if you want software, you have to write code. Um, so this is a different representation to string diagrams. Um, and this is abstract syntax because I'm not a very good programmer and I don't know how to write a parser. Um, so how you can read this so, so this example represents the market for lemons. Um, I'm going to start drawing on the screen now. Um, so here we have a prior probability distribution um, on a used car, which is good or bad with ratio one to four. And we draw from that distribution and then we put the result of, the, of that Random variable into the, into a variable called quality. So we we give it a, we bind it to a name. The next thing that happens is we have a player called the seller um, who observes this variable called called quality, and then they make a choice, a strategic choice between low and high, and that choice gets put into a variable called price. Now the next thing that happens is that a player called buyer um observes price but they do not observe quality that's what makes this economically interesting right this the used car salesman knows whether it's a good car or not but the buyer doesn't know um and then they choose to buy or not buy and we put that we also put that decision in the variable and then payoffs are assigned so um we have a pair of utility functions which have been defined somewhere else um, and these are haskell functions and they depend on these variables um, and in particular, um, this, this thing here, the utility for the seller depends on what the buyer does, which looks like it hasn't happened yet. Um, and that's because that, that variable is actually going backwards. Okay. Um, okay, 
so I wrote a compiler for this and it compiles to Haskell so it produces this what looks like line noise just huge blocks of horrible things and this is valid Haskell okay um, as a sideline state box have produced exactly the thing which I thought we didn't have time to wait for um, this is a web tool which actually does this is a fork of it which does actually spit out also valid Haskell code for open games um, I don't have very much time to talk about this, so I'm going to move on. There are certain very specific reasons that this currently isn't quite useful for the kind of things I have in mind, um, but it's very close. So we're, we're, we're very close to um, everything being wonderful. Okay, so the tool I made, which is a Haskell library and application, is what in computer science would be called a model checker. It's a counterexample finding tool. So, um, so what you actually do is that the user puts in a strategy profile, and then if the strategy profile you put in is not in equilibrium, then the tool finds all of the failures of equilibrium, by which I mean all of the points at which a player has incentive to unilaterally deviate. Um, what can't it do, so, so the big thing that it can't do is compute equilibrium. So, so there is a subject called, algorith called algorithmic game theory, which is largely about computing equilibria. Um, and the first thing that everybody learns about algorithm, algorithmic game theory is that computing equilibria is very hard. It's in, a, it's in a complexity class which is considered intractable. Um, we, so infinitely repeated games, um, have been worked out in theory by the team in Strathclyde, um, but my tool doesn't support it because I don't know how to implement it. It doesn't support continuous action spaces, only discrete. It doesn't support infinitely supported probability distributions, only, only finitely supported. And it doesn't really support parameterized families of games. Um, it supports this little bit to the extent that you get it for free from Haskell. So suppose you're me and you're looking for a good application with which to hit uh, with open games. So what, what would make a good application? So the big constraint here is that we can't compute equilibrium. Um, this tool supports something like a guess, a guess and check methodology where you guess an equilibrium, you put it into the tool, the tool tells you that you messed up, um, and then you, you, based on what it tells you, you adjust your guess. Um, there is no, in, in most cases, there is no actual algorithm that you can use to converge to an equilibrium given this data. Um, because if there was, then compute equilibrium would be easy. Um, so usually it, it feels like you're fighting a losing battle against the tool on any, on any example that's too big. Uh, you guess something, something goes wrong, you take it into account, you adjust your guess, and then something totally unrelated goes wrong. And then that happens forever. Um, so, so we can't we can't have an example which is too big because if it's too big, we can't successfully guess an equilibrium. We just have no hope. Um, if it's too small, then there's no use to use compositionality. There's no use to use compositional game theory. Just use game theory. No compositionality needed. Um, and the thing that keeps me awake all night is no, is that um, it could it could still be that there's nothing in between these that. Um, the computational limitations kick in soon enough that compositionality doesn't actually buy you anything in practice. This is the worst case scenario. Okay. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, one f so one from Cole asking, does model checking in the sense in your previous slide, does it have some complexity? I guess they mean, does it have some, uh, is it in some, complexity class that people know this about. the the computational difficulty of what this tool does is trivial it's it's linear time in the size of the game uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, at least in the in the size of the game um, in its composition tree as built from sequential and parallel out of pieces um, under the hood it works by brute force so um, if you have, if your players have n choices, it just goes through all of them. So in that sense, it's it's still exponential that it has to check everything. Mm -hmm. I had a question which 
point do you want to compute equilibria? Except for theory reasons, I can see it's very nice to know about equilibria. If you're actually playing a game, it seems actually that finding ways that you can win or deviate from what you're doing and improve what your 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 payoff seems more essential than finding equilibria. Yeah. Um, this is a question that leads into a whole lot of game theory and economics. Um, equilibria are still useful. So, so usually you'd be using this to model a situation game theoretically, not, not that you're playing a game, but, but you want to study a situation in which other people are playing a game. <laughs> and of course, by game here, I mean something that's almost totally unrelated to anything you play for fun. Uh, I guess you'll, you'll see this coming up, but, but actually um, my last bullet point here, um, sometimes in, in some situations, Nash equilibria turn, turn out to be kind of useful and meaningful as a, as a real world prediction or some kind of fact about the world. And in other, in other situations, it doesn't. And this just takes some experience and often some data. I mean, if they're extremely hard to compute, it's sort of, seems implausible that the real world would find yes. themselves in them yes. at least not without a long amount of yes time. <laughs> yes you're right you're right mm -hmm. um this is a major research topic let's let's leave to that um, there's a lot to say about this um anyway we have we have a bunch of constraints we have we have constraints coming from game theory itself we have constraints coming from um the limitations of my programming ability and the implementation, um, and what we would what we would like as a positive feature is um, common abstractions that appear in several places throughout the game theoretic situation that we can exploit to abstract out compositionally. So we want we want kind of we want to be able to leverage our compositionality somewhere. Okay, so there's a failed example that I was working with Philip Sun where we had. We had high hopes that um, this was going to be world changing because most of the conditions that we needed were satisfied. Um, this was to do with um, a resale market. So you, you have players bidding for something and then afterwards they face a real resale market. So a player could give a high bid either because they believe that the thing is valuable or because they believe that somebody else is valuable and that they believe they can sell it for a profit later. Um, and if you're an economist, you would like to study in detail how the exact structure of the auction in the market um, affect what will happen. Um, and the situation is a bit too, bit too big to comfortably draw the extensive form game. Um, the, we satisfied most of what we need and then we came unstuck because the standard model of this is continuous and uses calculus to talk about its maximization. And also, Philip happens to be interested in parameterized families of games of these things. So, study how this thing um, varies, how the result varies as you vary some parameter. Okay, here's a uh, more successful looking example, which is ongoing work, and I'm going to talk through this in some detail. I wish I had a bit more time. Um, so, in a common pool resource. So a common pool resource is something like a fishery or a forest or something like that, where you have a limited resource, or in fact, in some cases, the environment itself on a global scale. But these are usually considered on, on smaller scales than the entire planet. Um, so we have a limited resource, and then we have a bunch of players who, who have two choices, and they're playing a social dilemma again. So they can either follow the rules, only extract what they're supposed to extract, or they can break the rules and get a lot more. Um, and the socially good situation will be everybody follows the rules because then the, the resource is conserved, um, but everybody has individual incentive to break the rules, and what we actually observe in, in the real world is that players do break the rules and conserve resources, so environmental destruction is not a 21st century phenomenon, it's a Stone Age phenomenon. Stone Age societies do completely destroy their like completely deforest their environment and so forth. Um, so so this, is a, this is a situation where Nash equilibrium is useful because it correctly describes what we observe in the world. Okay, 
So the example that we're working on is an irrigation channel. Um, so in this sense, we have farmers arranged down an irrigation channel from upstream to downstream, and each of them has a choice to either take their allotted amount of water or to block the channel and take all of the water. Um, so yeah, in the real world, we commonly observe that um, everybody takes too much or many people take too much and then the land at the bottom of the irrigation system is barren because no water makes it to the bottom even though there was enough for everybody to have adequate water. Okay, um, so you would like to add a monitor and you would like to penalise people who have discovered rule breaking in order to incentivize them to follow the rules, which is fine, but the monitor is also a human. They're usually a member of the community themselves. Um, so we would like to um, incentivize them as a human. So one smart idea that um, Elena Ostrom discovered being used in the field was um, to give the monitor the bottom plot as payment. They get the bottom plot in the irrigation system so this thing only has any value to them if water reaches the bottom. So they suddenly have incentive to catch meters because they want water to reach the bottom. Okay, so we'd like to study this. So, well, this was described to me. I sketched out a string diagram. Okay, I'm going to have to unfortunately uh, accelerate very hard here and get through most of what I wanted to say here. Um, but you can, um, You can, um, so, I, so I implemented this in code, um, and then we can, we can um, check situations. So we can put in strategies, and then we can observe that following the rules, for example, is not an equilibrium, because everybody wants to, everybody wants to cheat. Um, and you can see the, pay, the payoff functions are written in Haskell, but they're written in a sufficiently small fragment of Haskell, but they're actually quite readable. Okay, um, we have to open the boundary because the previous thing I drew is a closed game, but we want to then compose this, and that means opening the boundary. And to do this, we have to think ahead to how we're going to use this thing. Um, so in particular, well, we take we can pull off a copy of the move and just output it, but then also, later, we're going to want to apply punishments to these farmers. So we're going to take in some extra numbers as input and then subtract it. So the lesson here is that we had to think ahead in order to, we had to think about what we want to do with this later in order to design, in order to design a good abstraction now. Um, so my claim is that as category theory gets more and more applied, this is going to look more and more like object-oriented programming, which is probably exactly the thing that nobody wants to hear. Okay, um, these things get more and more complicated. Uh, yeah, more and more complicated. Um, in the end, we came up with a better example, and this um, is a little gizmo that, uh, and this is still a, a bona fide string diagram, but this looks like a step in this uh, irrigation system where water comes in from the left and goes out to the right. Um, so then we can string a bunch of these together and our string diagram actually now looks like the irrigation system that we're, that we're modeling where we inject 10 units of water at the end and then anything that comes out at the bottom is discarded. Okay, and it's still code. So we can still, we can still probe this with strategy profiles and the tool will still tell us. So this example has no, uh, no monitors. So, so we still get a, we still get deviation. So this is, uh, I, I, uh, I didn't go any further than this in the slides because um, this is uh, still work in progress, but this is a, a promising line of work, I think. Okay, so I want to, maybe I'll, I might overrun by two minutes. It's okay. Um, please don't kill me. Um, um, because I want to give some general conclusions. My number one conclusion is that the promised benefits of applied category theory and in particular compositionality are still not easy to actually attain in practice on real examples. Um, there is still serious work to be done. In particular, I think we need a lot more dialogue with the main experts and a lot more equal and detailed dialogue with the main experts. Um, and not not just you read something that 
uh, domain experts are interested in, in X, so we come up with the categorification of X. A lot more detailed than that. Um, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary work is individually costly to us as scientists, uh, both on our end in category theory and also on the on our collaborators' end in in um, in the domain in the field of application. Um, Designing good abstractions, even after you've come up with a compositional theory, uh, designing good abstractions using that compositional theory is still an art form. Um, I envis envisage that several decades in the future, we're going to have uh, design patterns for category theory. Um, we need software. We don't necessarily need string diagram software. We can get by without it, although it would be very nice. Um, a funny conclusion I drew is that string diagrams may not even be the best representation for open games. This might depend very heavily on specifically on the game theory domain. Um, but this little language I drew, although the current syntax is extremely ugly, um, being able to bind, instead of having strings, having um, things bound to variable names actually is, is quite convenient in some ways. Um, economics. And by economics here, I mean academic economics, not the Platonic ideal of economics. Um, it's something like a worst case scenario for collaborating with, um, for various reasons. Um, the fact is that this stuff is, to a first approximation, simply not publishable in economics. Um, and for my, as a result of that, for my collaborators, this hasn't, on, a, on, on paper, this hasn't paid off for them. Um, five years of work with me or seven years of work with me, they, they would probably disagree. Um, but um, if you look at it on paper, um, if, you, if, you look, if you look at it on paper, this looks like a very unequal deal where I got a lot more of the benefit than they did for career-wise. Um, this means that it's hard to get new economists in and we can't do without them. This we, we need more and more economists over time. Um, the other reason we need economics publications is that we would like interdisciplinary funding and if you try to apply interdisciplinary funding, if you only have publications in one field, that's probably not going to fly. Um, I don't want to end on a downer, I want to end on, on good news. So there is certainly there is evidence that applied category theory can support a practical modeling workflow. Um, the other thing which I'm excited about, which is I was talking about earlier, is that several different types of learning share a common foundation, which is these lenses, optics, open games. Um, so this is, I, envis I envisage a new categorical foundation of cybernetics, which is yeah, too much hype in one place. Um, and at this point I will stop. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, if people flip a 20-sided die and ask a question if it lands heads up, <laughs> that, that would be fine. That is, unmute yourself and ask a question with low probability because there are 90 people here. Uh, okay, I'll try. Okay. Hi. Um, Jules, so in, uh, at some point you had the irrigation example and that was yeah. very interesting for me because you presented, I mean, or Ostrom presented, I don't know, this idea of incentivating basically people to discover other people breaking the rules. Yeah. Um, this is a major game theoretic argument that is used in... Um, smart contract design for cryptocurrencies uh -huh. right now. So if you look at a lot of crypto protocols, there is exactly this problem. You have some rules that must be enforced, but in the end, some players may do whatever they want. They, we call them C bills. And so you have to enforce other people to do surveillance on them and you do it with economic incentives. So also connected to the idea of interdisciplinary funding, have you considered the idea of applying for funding, for instance, from the Ethereum Foundation to do research in this direction? 
because I'm pretty sure they would hear you out and no, I never thought about that yeah that's actually a good idea I should look into that okay, which yeah. foundation was that the Ethereum Foundation, oh, it's uh -huh. uh, basically yeah. the Ethereum research uh, body. Um, and they are, they are interested in a lot of things, but at the moment is from the technical side, mainly cryptography uh, and I guess uh, game theory and everything that can be applied to smart contract design, basically. So I would mm -hmm. give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Other questions? Hi, Jules. Hi. Uh, so I had a question uh, about, so you mentioned at one point several types of learning. You mentioned uh, reinforcement learning, you mentioned open learner, uh, learners, you mentioned variational inference. And I'm curious, so I was under the impression that you can't model learning via open games because you just have a map from the strategies to these uh, lenses and not any contravariant map sort of going back to the strategies. This was the topic of some discussions. So, but you, but you mentioned that this has been done in some ways. So I'm just curious, how does learning work here? Well, uh, I mean, the, the, the map back to the parameters um, is, is the update map, right? You start with an initial parameters, you put it into a, into a, a context, and then you get an updated parameters. Oh, right. Okay. So, uh, but I was under the impression. So, but if you look at the definition of the open game, right, we just have a parameterized family of lenses or optics, right? There's nothing going back to the parameters. There's stuff going back. No, no, to the... there is. Uh -huh. this is a pain to scroll quickly through this uh, because every second time it doesn't go. <laughs> ah. Okay. Anyway, in short, yes. Um, open game is not just a parameterized family of optics. It's also the other thing, which is the thing that gives you the best response in a context. Almost there. It's the thing which I also spend three slides trying to explain how it composes. Uh, there we go. The third point here. So given a given a strategy profile and a context, we get a, a in general a set of updated strategy profiles. Right. I guess that's different from the equilibria. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah. Half the time I half the time I talk about equilibria, which is a slight rearrangement of this. Um, this is the version which, among other things, is useful for learning. Right, yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Um, I guess I had a question as to whether your market was your mainly uh, theoretical economists who are maybe trying to understand equilibria or whether, the, well, it sounds like you're also looking at various other markets. There's, there's a kind of market you can imagine where it's people trying to make lots of money or trying cool. to win a game in some manner or other. And they would have incentives perhaps to invest money in trying out new theoretical techniques if they thought it would help uh, them. Which is to say hedge funds. Um, my, my idealized user is a modeler. Mm -hmm. Whatever they're using it for, it's, these things are designed with modeling in mind. So not, in general, not theorists. Although, of course, the, the, the boundary between theory and application depends on which direction you're looking from. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in general, I, I always, since five years ago, envisioned open games being used for really quite down-to-earth things. Um, this is why I'm very happy with this, this example with uh, um, irrigation, because it, it, it feels extremely down-to-earth. Yeah, I was just thinking that the search for equilibria seems like more of a some kind of 
theoretical economics quest. I could be yes. wrong. Um, so, but, so, so this is a kind of crossroads that we're, we're at now. Um, or one of them is um, we put a lot of work into making sure that uh, we could we could capture Nash equilibria as as it's officially defined. Um, now we've kind of exhausted the the theory side quite a lot. So now we're looking towards applications, and that means um, a lot of settings where Nash equilibrium is invalid, but things that look a little bit like Nash equilibrium are. Uh, um, uh, potentially interesting. So, so actually, the the connection with machine learning actually could be useful for mm -hmm. economics as well, because you would actually like to talk about agents who are learning, mm -hmm. right? Your your agent is actually located inside the game. They have some some optimization target, and they're playing the game, um, and they're learning a strategy in order to improve their uh, improve their payoff. And this, this I think is is quite exciting. Of course, lots of people are working on this kind of thing. This is definitely not the only only person that's uh, that's come up with an idea like this. Um, but um, yeah, it sounds like a good direction to explore. But you're right. You're right. Lots of other people are probably trying to do different things like that. But that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the 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 short thing is that you replace best response with better response. So best response um, is this kind of strange thing that everybody, every individual player individually jumps to the optimum given what everybody else did. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas if, if um, replacing this with some kind of better response where everybody is gradient descending on their individual payoff, mm -hmm. um, this, is a, this is definitely a, a, a promising thing for um, we're cut, um, getting closer to real life in a lot of situations while still retaining something that's recognizably game theory. Because the risk is that you throw out, and say throw out the baby with the bathwater. If you, if you try to fix things too much, you're not doing game theory anymore. You're doing dynamical systems or something like that. So someone asks that maybe the equilibrium questions are more connected to physics problems than yeah. in game theory. There might be some physics applications of <laughs> the same ideas. So, okay, a, a thing I'm all, I always try to be clear about is that um, equilibrium in economics almost never means dynamical equilibrium. Um, usually they're, they're in equilibrium in some kind of epistemic belief space. Um, this, is, this is how it is possible that for example, a market can be in equilibrium, but something can happen tomorrow that didn't happen today. Mm -hmm. Because the equilibrium actually is in a, is in a belief domain. Any other and of questions? Course there's a, and of course, there's Go an ahead. army of physicists that try to do economics as well. <laughs> Are there any other vocal questions. We still have 74 people. I can't imagine that nobody of those 74 people is wondering anything. Uh, I, I actually had a question. Um, so early on, you showed um, differentiation and you showed this dx equals dy over f prime. Yeah. Right. And, and that's, it just strikes me as a little odd that you're using like the inverse of the derivative rather than, I, I guess I sort of, I think I understand this and it's about like, in my opinion, sort of changing the association structure of um, composing the derivatives. It's like, we're talking about linear functionals versus little displacements. So I'm, yeah. a, little, I'm a little surprised by that equation. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Um, I guess the, why did why the, why did you divide by the f prime of, instead of having it over on the left side of that? So so the alternative is to say that dy equals f prime of x dx. That would be the that would be the covariant version. I, I guess I'm not in entire. So I, mean, I think it's about whether you're mapping little displacements forwards versus linear functionals backwards. Yes, we're mapping linear functionals backwards. So, so formally, yeah, this, so formally 
dx and dy are what's i think that the technical term is gradient covectors yeah one so forms or covectors yeah yeah hmm. uh, okay. unfortunately yeah, I'm, I'm i'm very sketchy on differential geometry <laughs> I don't know but the main question was why is it going backwards instead of forwards? And it sounds like it's sort of the reason is just that you want it to go backwards. You want to yeah. you want to yeah. figure out uh, what change in your input would be needed to affect a certain change in the output. Yes. So there's there's answers from opposite directions. One is that this is the thing which lenses describe, whereas the <laughs> other thing is described by something that is not lenses. Well, I think you, you wanted an answer that's more like, why do lenses describe what's so great about this thing versus the more yes. and then the, simple and then the answer thing. And then the answer from the opposite direction is that I believe that this is how machine learning does it. So this is back, you back propagate derivatives. So you take a, you take a gradient on the output and then you want to back propagate it through your neural network to get a gradient on the input. Yeah, it's just that um, sort of a rearranging things to use an inverse is not really what I see in like a reverse mode differentiation implementation. It's, um, it, I also don't see that it really makes sense to like invert a Jacobian mate. If, if it wasn't one dimension to one dimension, as you've shown here, like inverting yes. a possibly rectangular matrix, yes, confusing inverse. what that might mean, but Really, I think it's about the transpose of that matrix, not about the uh, the inverse of it. I don't know. I'm on, I'm on thin ice here. I need a machine learning expert <laughs> on the call to, to save me. So Bruno was saying in the chat, this is exactly how machine learning does it. So this yeah. seems, you, I guess so uh, maybe, Philip maybe, can maybe, argue with Bruno about that. <laughs> maybe to chip in, right? I, I guess I know uh, who was asking the question. Right, it's about the transpose of the Jacobian. And I guess the notation where you divide by dx is a bit strange, but uh, yeah, it's about the transpose in the end. But it's the, the point about going uh, backwards is also true. So not sure if that clears it up. Uh -huh. this, is, this is a thing that probably somebody should look into because if you do linear algebra, um, if you draw pictures uh, uh, in the category of monoidal category of vector spaces, Oxford style, um, you can draw you can draw the transpose very nicely. It's uh, mm -hmm. you rotate. It's uh, you bend your strings around and rotate. Um, this seems like a, a, a thing which somebody could look into, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you're going to figure out dx in terms of dy, you really do need to invert the transpose. Doesn't do it. But, yeah. And when the inverse doesn't exist, well then, which sometimes happens, then, then it just is indeed telling you that you cannot uniquely determine dx knowing dy. Uh -huh. uh, and that, that will happen whenever that Jacobian matrix is not invertible, that you can't I think you can't don't tell. have to, I don't think you don't have to invert a Jacobian matrix. It's about mapping linear functionals back. So you don't, you don't, you map displacements forwards and linear functionals back and one's through composition of the Jacobian and one's through composition of the Jacobian transpose. Uh -huh. uh, maybe we'll talk about this on the, on the chat. I think it's, an, it's interesting. Yeah, actually now I'm getting confused. Yes, I yeah, it's it's, it, if, if it's not the inverse, it's an interesting question why it's not the inverse because it certainly looks like it should be the inverse. Anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, Krakash is saying one does not do inversion in back propagation. Okay, that, that settles 